Book 2, Chapter 2, Prayer, the Preparation and the Practice, Matthew 6, verses 1 to 15, and verse 31. When I say preparation, let me explain what I do not mean. Suppose I am to preside at the breaking of bread service one Sunday, and on the Saturday afternoon a brother rings me up and says, Brother Colette, if you were thinking of calling upon me to pray tomorrow morning, I should be glad if you can let me know now so I can prepare what I'm going to say. He means, let me compose my sentences and let me polish my phrases. Now, I am not complaining one bit about such preparation. It is better to prepare and speak a well-thought-out prayer, which meets the need, rather than to neglect it and then fumble and fail in consequence. It is true, sometimes that kind of preparation produces a prayer which is rather decorous and formal, but not always by any means. It is proper and right where it is necessary. The only reason I bring it up is to remark that when I say preparation, I do not mean this kind of preparation. I do not mean getting ready to pray on some special occasion. I mean the preparation which touches our life, and so makes us ready to pray at all times. Let me put it to you another way. There are certain great facts in life which make it possible for us to come to God in prayer, and it is our responses in daily life to those facts which prepare us to pray. Before we proceed to examine this point, may I ask you to recall another great Bible principle. It is this. In the final analysis, the truth about God and his purpose is not truth in the abstract. That is to say, it is not revealed to us just to inform us. It is not revealed just for us to learn. It is not revealed just so that we can speculate and discuss. Truth always sets up a claim upon us. By its very nature, it makes a demand. Sometimes we speak of obeying the truth. It is not just something to be stored and labeled. The real purpose of spiritual truth is to change us and make us like God. The object of truth is godliness, God-likeness. Truths claim upon us. The truth we learn should become incarnate in our lives. A man who speculates, but never does, is half false already. The proportion by which a life is changed and sanctified by the truth is the proportion to which the individual is prepared for praying. Let us look at it more closely. Think of some of the great facts of the truth the fatherhood of God, the mediation of the Son as Savior and High Priest, the activity of the Holy Spirit in the Word of God, which is the light of our life. How we respond to these things will regulate our preparation for prayer. The measure of our response will be the measure of our preparedness. Think again. God is our Father. How do we respond to that? The essential feature of a father-child relationship is that the child is the extension of the father. Fatherhood is life given. Sonship is life received. In the ideal relationship, sons ought to be like their father. So we call ourselves the children of God, and yet sometimes we are very far from being like him. You would be hard put to see the identity. Again, Jesus once said, Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. In that short sentence, God is revealed as Father, Shepherd, and King. And when men once saw it superlatively in Jesus, the old things burst forth with a new beauty, such as humanity had never dreamed of. I say that, so when we seek to answer the claim of that revelation, we are being prepared for prayer. Let me illustrate. How can we pray, Thy kingdom come, if in some way we are rebelling against the King? How can we pray for the coming of the kingdom, and at the same time hinder the development of the kingdom values in our own life, even love, joy, and peace? How can we pray for the king's victory if we are nursing in our own life one of the things against which the king is fighting? Think of the shepherd. It is the sheep's part to be content with the pasture that the shepherd appoints. If I am not content and insist on regarding everything as drudgery, then I am ill-prepared to pray. If I am content to go where the shepherd leads, whether it be through the desert or by the still waters, content because he leads, then I am being prepared to pray. Think of the mediation of the Son. In 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30, the Apostle Paul has written, But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, 
who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. How do I answer the claim of that great truth? Righteousness is rightness of conduct, which arises out of sanctification, which is rightness of character. Paul is saying that the king is the source of that righteousness and that sanctification. He once said, Christ liveth in me. He meant that the life of Christ was to be reproduced in his own life. Now, when the indwelling Christ calls us to some new duty, some new responsibility, some new enterprise, how do we respond? If we respond with a ready consent, then we are being prepared to pray. But if we refuse, prayer then becomes most difficult. What makes us refuse? Something which we ought to repudiate but never do? Some relationship which pleases us but which is spiritually dangerous? Some indulgence which we cannot master and might master us? Some procrastination which robs us of our resolution? How difficult it is to pray! when forces such as these dominate us. Think of the Holy Spirit's revelation of God's purpose in His Holy Word. Part of the true preparation for prayer is a sincere response to the fact that the Son of God will soon burst upon the world with flaming Advent glory. We often say we long for His coming, but dare we examine our deepest thought upon that affirmation? Would we be very upset if He postponed His coming for, say, another twenty years? There are so many things to do, and life is so full of interest. And we have just fallen in love, or we have just been married, or graduated, or fixed on the date of retirement. I know the problems and the feelings. You are right to fall in love, and you are right to be married, or to graduate, or to retire, and may God bless you. But you ought always to recognize that all your activities may be interrupted at any moment by the appearance of the king. The present joy will be superseded by the greater joy. The present ambition must be subservient to the greater ambition. The man or woman who truly looks for and longs for the coming of the king is best prepared for prayer, because in order to pray prevailingly, I must live in the hope of that day when all the present pain and sorrow will be ended. If you have true compassion for humanity, if you can bring your sensitivity into touch with the world's agony, if there is in your heart a hot, turbulent protest against the wickedness of evil men, then you will be driven to prayer for the people in your street and for the world, that the glory and judgment of God may come and his government be triumphant in the earth. When the Spirit-revealed word creates in your heart such an agony and such a desire, do not check it, for that is to grieve the Spirit indeed. As the glory of the kingdom flames and flashes before us in the word of God, and as the demon of fear comes gibbering at the windows of the world, and as faith grows dim and love waxes cold, those who love his appearing are driven to pray for his coming. But we cannot truly pray for his coming in the world unless we are willing to have him established in our hearts. One is a preparation for the other. So I emphasize that, as it appears to me, preparation for prayer in the real sense is no slight, spasmodic, superficial thing. It is the supreme part of life. It is certainly not that we have to be perfect before we can pray, but there are hindrances to prayer which need to be removed in order for prevailing prayer to be achieved. To put it to you bluntly, to be willfully unsubmitted is to be painfully unprepared. To flirt with wrong things is to make praying difficult. To nurse an unconfessed sin is to create an ice barrier on the pathway of prayer. If you have ever been in that position, then your experience will have taught you how impossible it is to draw near in prayer. We know we ought to, but somehow we cannot. We intend to clear the obstacle and fall down in pleading, but we keep procrastinating. We try to forget, but somehow the controversy will not go away. David understood it and told it in Psalm 32. When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me, my moisture is turned into the drought of summer. Verses 3 and 4. The controversy was sustained. It could not be hidden. As you know, in the end, David acknowledged his failure, and the breach was healed, and the pathway was cleared. The window was opened, and commerce with heaven was restored. For at last, he says in verse 6, For this shall every one that is godly pray unto thee, in a time when thou mayest be found. 
No, I'm not saying that you can pray only when you are free from guilt, but I am saying that when we practice guile, that is a tremendous handicap in the path of prayer. David says, Blessed is the man in whose spirit there is no guile. Verse 2. So clean hands and a pure heart are best for those who seek to be alone with the great God. Hearts can be lifted to the majesty on high without being afraid, reverently indeed, but without dread. Practical Issues Come now to practice, and I want this to be genuinely practical. I bring you to Matthew 6. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. They love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions, as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their much speaking. Be ye not therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of, before ye ask him. Verses 5-8 to eight. Now we must not think that our Lord was teaching that there is something essentially wrong in praying in a synagogue or at the corner of a street. No, what he is warning against is that kind of prayer which obtrudes itself upon other men's notice. Praying that desires to be observed. Notice his gentle satire. They have the reward. What he meant was, they pray in order to be seen of men, and they have been seen of men. What they wanted, they received. They have been paid in full. The important teaching is the instruction to which this warning is a background. When thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father which is in secret. Evidently, the king is teaching that for his disciples there should be, if possible, a place of prayer and a method of prayer, so that every third party is excluded, and the disciple may pray alone with God through the high priest. It is, of course, possible to pray anywhere, at any time, under any conditions. I know a man in Christ in a very busy job, and he told me, that he has breaks of, say, 30 seconds between one action and the next. In those 30 seconds, he utters a short prayer, 30 seconds of sanctuary, in which he finds God. But in this passage, our Lord is teaching us about the need for an inner chamber and a closed door. Prayers in secret tend to be more real than prayers in public, and generally more free from drowsiness. So the instruction seems to be stressing the need for a process which ensures separation, seclusion, and secrecy. In other words, the formation of a habit of prayer. It is sometimes said that habits are in themselves less valuable because they are habits. But the truth is, it does depend upon what the habit is about. After all, a habit is only something you do habitually, and to pray habitually is just what the king enjoins upon his disciples, that they ought always to pray and not to faint. The Apostle Paul says, pray without ceasing. This is not occasional, spasmodic, irregular prayer. It is habitual. It is not possible to make inflexible rules about the place, the time, and the method. Individual circumstances will decide these issues, but they must be decided with honesty and integrity. If somebody can honestly spend only three minutes at the beginning of the day with God, then if that three minutes is sincere and true, God can do a lot in a short time. But the person who gives three minutes only, when they could well give fifteen in prayer and meditation, is not very likely to move many mountains. Again, the place does not matter, as long as it provides some kind of solitude, where the faculties of mind and heart are unfettered. And it follows, therefore, that, if possible, the place should be familiar, and the same every day, so it will not offer any distraction. The place we know well will not cause our mind to wander to outside things. The method must suit our needs. We should cultivate the method which helps us most to pray rightly. Some people may prefer to speak aloud, while others would commune only through the mind. The attitude or posture is again a matter for individual judgment, remembering that we should choose the position which enables us to concentrate most easily. If you suffer from rheumatism, then kneeling is a bad position for it will focus your mind on the pain in your knees instead of on God your Father. It is not a sin to be comfortable whilst at prayer. Rather, it is sensible. 
I find in my own case that it is most suitable for me to sit. If there is no room where you may go for solitude and silence, and I know that sometimes it is a real difficulty, if there is no place in the open where you may go and be alone with God, then the only thing to do is try to cultivate the capacity to provide an open space where you can withdraw even in the presence of others. This is not easy, and for those who are not experienced in the habit of prayer, the real inner chamber is a great boon. Praying is an exercise which demands that every faculty shall be at its best, and therefore, if you can do it, it is good to pray when you are most alert and most alive. Right at the end of the day, when the eyes droop and the mind is full of slumber, is not best for concentrated prayer. Two minutes of lay-me-down-to-sleep prayer is all right, but it should not be the main prayer of the day, though in a busy life it sometimes is. The trouble is that drowsy prayer is not the prayer which is disciplined, concentrated, and earnest. I must remind you of some words written about the king. And in the morning, a great while before day, he rose up and went out and departed into a desert place and there prayed. It shows us that prayer is a serious thing involving deliberate and conscious dedication. It is not a byproduct of life. It is at the center of life. What shall we pray about? It seems to me that we may pray about anything which is upon our heart and hopefully within the sphere of God's will. I mean, if we know for sure that there is something which is against God's will, we ought not to pray about it. In the world, men tend to divide their lives into that which is spiritual and that which is secular. In the life of the disciple, that kind of a division is not justifiable. No part of our lives is shut out when we are shut in with God. Because he is our Father, we pray as children, and there is an artlessness about children's prayers which it is helpful to mark. I think it is true that as our life becomes more responsive to the great facts that make praying possible, so our petitions will probably get fewer. We may cease to pray about some things which at one time in our lives seemed to be so important. It may well be that with experience the approach about praying for our needs may change also. Experience may change our attitudes. Again, let me illustrate with a homely example. In a certain ecclesia, there was a sister who always used to pray for a fine day for the Sunday school outing. Of course, sometimes it was fine, and sometimes it rained cats and dogs. One day, when arrangements were being made for the outing, the superintendent said to the elderly sister, And sister, have you prayed for a fine day? And she responded, No, I have stopped asking God to make our day fine, for I have realized it may be his will to make it wet for other people's sake. What I have prayed is that in making our choice of the date, you will have enough sense to choose one of the days that God has decided to make fine. It made us laugh, but notice the change in approach. It may be on a low level, but it illustrates the point. Prayer has its place in the infinitesimals of life. Nehemiah prayed about building a wall. He prayed about his work. There are those who reserve prayer for desperate occasions, but it is not the best kind of prayer. In prayer, a man may go over his life and lay it all before God, small and great. Prayer sanctifies commonplace things and ennobles menial tasks, so that you do not mind that they seem so commonplace and menial. Pray about anything, and experience will tell you before long what you can leave out of your prayers. Mere whims and foolish desires will appear in their true light and will be dropped in prayer. It is no use praying to go on in one direction and then set your feet in the opposite direction. Nehemiah prayed about his work and then used all his wits and his skill to make it happen. It is no good praying about your work and then neglecting it. Prayer has the effect of increasing vision and developing judgment. You will come to know what to pray about, but in the Word of God there are clear guidances about what we ought to include in our praying. We ought to pray for our brethren and sisters. Jesus did, and so did Paul. We ought to pray for the Word of God that it may run and be glorified. We ought to pray for the ecclesia of Christ and those who have responsibility therein. Very often, praying is better than criticizing. We ought to pray for the coming of the kingdom of God. We ought to pray for those who have been set in authority over us in civil government. We ought to pray for the sick and the isolated. There are those who, so to speak, have a natural right to our prayers those in our own family whom we love and for whom we may be responsible. Job prayed for his children, 
lest they perchance in their living did some wrong thing. Praying for all kinds of things calls for sympathy, understanding, and watchfulness, being keen-eyed and seeing the needs and trials of others, and remembering them before God in the secret place. I know some brethren and sisters who keep a list of things they want to pray about. They do not feel it is right to throw one great careless bundle before God in prayer, but each need is singled out, each person individually remembered before the throne of grace. I have a prayer list of people for whom I pray every day. I find it much better than leaving it to chance. Paul says, God shall supply all your need, every need of yours, R.V., according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Philippians 4 verse 19. Every need seems to suggest all kinds of things. May I now say that, of course, praying involves other things besides petitions. Worship, thanksgiving, communion. But in this section, we are thinking mostly about petitions, about asking for blessings and helps of various kinds. Preconditions for Prayer There are two preconditions for prayer of which I am thinking just now. One is in Matthew 5. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Verses 23 and 24. It seems clear that no gift and no prayer can be received by God if the offerer has a heart which is hardened against another of God's children. An unforgiving spirit makes prayer void. Reconciliation clears the pathway. The refusal to be reconciled bolts the door. The same principle is revealed in Psalm 66, verse 18. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Meaning that if I cling to sin, it is no good coming in the guise of righteousness. In a way, the judgment seat of God is sometimes in the secret place. What I mean is this. Sometimes forgotten and unforgiven sins start into life when we begin to pray. Praying needs a conscience which is set on dwelling in light. Or, put another way, he who comes to God for mercy must himself be merciful. The petitioner for grace must be gracious. The other condition is the need to pray in faith. Atheists cannot pray. Agnostics find it hard. The king once said, All things are possible to him that believeth. Faith is trust. It is not a speculation, an option, a pious guess. Jesus said, Therefore I say unto you, Whatsoever things ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. Mark 11, verse 24. In the letter of James, doubt is double-minded and unstable. It is like a troubled sea storm-tossed and driven by the wind. Such a man gets nothing from his prayers because he is double-minded and doubting. Then we must learn this. It is possible to ask amiss. He ask and receive not because ye ask amiss that ye may spend it in your pleasures. James 4 verse 3 RV Evidently, God takes notice not only of what we ask for, but also why we want it. God looks at the heart and we have to face it there are some hearts that will have difficulty in finding an audience with him. The unbelieving heart has no access. The unforgiving heart is shut out. The self-seeking heart is halted. So the message is, ask believingly in accordance to the law of faith, and do not be afraid of asking. The king said, ask and ye shall receive. Paul said, in nothing be anxious, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. As I have said already, prayer is not all asking. It is thanksgiving and worship and contrition and submission, but it certainly includes asking. It is sometimes said, why do we need to ask if God knows what we want before we ask him? Why pray if he knows? Because asking is different from giving information. It is one thing to inform, it is another thing to beseech in faith. It is revealed to us that although the God of heaven knows our needs before we ask him, notwithstanding, he waits to be asked before he distributes the gifts that supply our every need. Your father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, give us this day our daily bread. Matthew 6, verse 8 to 11. 
Jesus is saying that because God knows our needs before we ask him and is willing to answer them, the more we ought to ask him. So when you pray, have faith in God. It is something he never dishonors. In Leviticus chapter 10, you can read of two men who offer strange fire before the Lord and were destroyed. We must always regard prayer seriously. Try to avoid the mechanical and the perfunctory. The Bible says God responds to prayers which are fervent. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Intensity is part of the law of prayer. You remember, God hates the lukewarm. It is easy to shine. It is more difficult to burn. God is found most by those who seek him with all their heart. He is not found by those who are flippant, merely curious, self-reliant, and intellectually proud. Speak to God in simplicity. Leave the eloquence to the place of public prayer. God does not want a lecture. He wants a prayer. You do not have to persuade God, but he likes us to ask him faithfully and fervently.